Thinking that abundance is incompatible with spirituality is a myth that influences many of us and is the largest impediment there is to feeling worthy. What do we mean when we use this word selfish? The myth that abundance and spirituality are incompatible is fueled by thoughts that it is selfish and improper to visualize and desire material things. Let's examine this attitude and determine if you have been influenced into believing it to be your truth. Take a look around your world and notice the abundance and endlessness of our universe. It goes on and on beyond our ability to imagine its vastness. This abundance flows from the same energy that comprises our fundamental essence. It is you. You are it. Material form is how spirit makes itself known to us while we are in form ourselves. Spirit manifests in trees and oceans and fish, birds, minerals, vegetables, flowers, and you. Matter is not an illusion or something that ought not to be, but it is the necessary means through which spirit differentiates itself on this plane of existence. To feel that it is selfish or non-spiritual to desire and manifest is to divide the world of spirit and the world of matter into polar opposites. When we adopt an attitude of spirit being incompatible with matter, we are denying the spirit that is in matter as its originating energy. We also deny the validity of ourselves as spiritual beings. When we shift to seeing that together they comprise one harmonious whole, we remove the stigma of selfishness. Just as each one of us is one harmonious whole comprised of spirit and matter, so too is the entire universe. The process of life taking form is a mystery. That mystery is governed by a creative energy that is knowable when we genuinely feel worthy of receiving its blessings in form. Abundance is the way of the creative force in the universe. You are entitled to have abundance in your life and to radiate prosperity to all that you encounter in your world. Nothing is gained by making yourself small and insignificant other than to manifest smallness and insignificance into your life. There are some core components of worthiness. Everything you need to master in order to make this fifth principle a working model in your life is available as a mental activity. You do not need to go out into the world and conquer it in any way. It is simply a matter of changing your mind about your basic worthiness to receive all of God's blessings, be they material or otherwise. Here are five major perceptions of beings who know they are worthy and deserving of all of God's blessings. The first says, my self-esteem comes from myself. This person's statement of his or her inner perceptions might be something like the following, as a child of God, my worthiness is a given. I am not divided into spirit and body, rather I am a part of the all-knowing creation called God itself. Too often the ideas of other egos are what constitute our impressions of ourselves. We listen to the admonitions of others who have low self-regard and who are attempting to exert influence and power over us. It is beyond the scope of most young children to resist these ideas. But as adults, we can look back at this hypothesis and free ourselves from its absurdity. You must know within that you are part of the light that lighteth every man. You are evidence of the existence of God. And in your own particularized individuality, you have God within you. Therefore, you must be able to say with conviction, God is me and I am God. It is this truth that will free you from your feelings of unworthiness to attract to yourself all that you desire. Your desires are the very tools that allow you to grow and experience the perfection of the universe. They take you beyond any limitations that you might have embraced and lead you to a higher spiritual awareness. Even the idea of achieving enlightenment and mastery is a desire and one you must honor. A second statement of those who feel worthy. I accept myself without complaint. A person with this self-perception thinks something like the following. I am willing to face everything about myself without lapsing into self-contempt or repudiating my essential value as a piece of God. Self-acceptance is something that must be unconditionally known within ourselves. To accept oneself is not necessarily to accept every behavior. Rather, it is a refusal to engage in sabotaging acts of self-loathing. If you are in a state of self-rejection, you cannot feel worthy of the munificence of the universe. Your inner energy is centered on what is wrong with yourself and with complaining to yourself and anyone who will listen. Self-acceptance is nothing more than a shift in consciousness. It requires only a change of mind. If your hair is falling out, then you have the choice to mask it, worry about it, or accept it. Acceptance means that you honor your body and the divine intelligence that is at work. 
and when someone else implies that you have a problem because your hair is falling out, you don't even know how to relate to their observation. Acceptance removes the label of problem. This is not a faked attitude. It is merely removing the ego from your inner assessments, which are centered on the approval of others. With self-acceptance, you are able to honestly say, I am what I am, and I accept it. Once this attitude is firmly in place from a position of self-honesty, your worthiness to receive the gifts of the universe become aligned with that divine power. A third attitude of self-acceptance. I take full responsibility for my life and what it is and is not. To be willing to accept total responsibility for yourself puts you in a position of being worthy of receiving and attracting the objects of your desire. If someone else is responsible for your perceived shortcomings and you are blaming them for these troubles, then you are also saying that in order to manifest your heart's desire, you need to have the permission of those others. This act of abdicating responsibility destroys your ability to empower yourself to higher levels of awareness. I come from the position that there are absolutely no accidents and that everything that occurs in my life has a lesson attached to it and that I brought it into my life. Thus, if I'm having a negative thought and at the same moment I bump my head on a cupboard door, I say, what was I thinking at that moment? And I take full responsibility for correcting those negative thoughts and for the bump that reminded me to correct that kind of thinking. This little game serves me in the sense of taking full responsibility for my life and eradicating the inclination to blame other people or circumstances. I trust in this inner knowledge. I rely on seemingly coincidental happenings and I know that I am responsible for all of it. As this sense of responsibility has grown, I find it impossible to blame anyone for anything in my life. The willingness to be responsible without complaining puts you into the natural flow of all divine energy. With an attitude of self-responsibility, you will notice that the heavens are exceedingly cooperative. The word God has the same sound that is in virtually all of the names for the original creator. All traditions describe a creator of the word and humankind. Here is a list of names used for the creator. Ra, Krishna, Rama, Uda, Adonai, Brahman, Siddha, Shiva, Jehovah, Kali Durga, Tat, Gayana, Mahanta, Mahavira, Anu, Atva, Nanak, Yahweh, God, Allah. The obvious sound that is in all of these names for the Creator is the sound Ah. Ah expresses a feeling of bliss and joy. The sounds of creation and joy are synonymous. It is not an accident that the name for the Creator in virtually all languages contains the sound Ah. Ah is the only sound that humans make effortlessly, simply by taking in a breath and without moving the lips, the tongue, the jaw, or the teeth. If you move any of these, the sound changes. Ah is the sound of effortless perfection, as is creation itself effortless and perfect. Ah, the sound of creation is one sound you will want to use as you practice the language of Siddhi consciousness. It takes you beyond the incessant self-dialogue that characterizes your mind. When you repeat the sound, ah, in connection with your manifestation meditation practice, you are literally repeating the name of God. In Reflections of the Self, Swami Muktananda gives these words to his devotees who desire to know more about the state of Siddhi consciousness. With eyes brimming with love, sing his name. All inner mysteries will be disclosed. Every bird and plant will reveal itself to you as Brahman. The knowledge of Vedanta will manifest everywhere. O oh, dear one, keep chanting God's name while sitting or standing or involved in the world. Never forget him. Unite your mind with the self. He explained that these names for God have specific combinations of inherently powerful syllables that have the ability to call forth the experience of God within us. Making these sounds acquaints us, perhaps for the first time, with the subtle God force within ourselves. Thousands of years ago, Patanjali set down his highly celebrated Yoga Sutras. They were designed to help guide seekers to the highest state of awareness, Siddhi Consciousness. He offered this advice, repeat and meditate on Aum. Aum is a symbol for the universal sound of creation. Repeating this sound causes the disappearance of obstacles and an awakening of a new, higher consciousness that is the creative energy. Continually chant God's name is the advice of the masters of self-awareness to those who seek to participate in the act of creating and manifesting. The sound Ah is the sound of God. 
Make the repetition of the name of God a daily meditation practice, and you will literally transform yourself into this universal sound of creation. You will become one with the sound that mediates between the world of form and the highest frequencies of the spiritual world. This creation meditation is also involved with two chakras of the body. Of the seven chakras of the body, two are significant in learning this manifesting technique. The base chakra, the sex center, is one, and the third eye, located between the eyebrows, is the other. Imagine for yourself a channel between the base chakra and your third eye. You are going to clear this imaginary passageway between these two chakras and feel yourself open the third eye so that you can imaginatively project your manifesting energy out the new opening. The base chakra is the center of procreation. The third eye chakra is for the purpose of manifestation. Think of your third eye as the part of you that makes contact with the physical world that is invisible to the naked eye. You are attempting to open this third eye through the language of your city consciousness. Now remembering that ah is the sound of joy as well as the God sound, think about the sound that accompanies the process of procreation. Ah is the most common sound heard in the very act of procreation. And more often than not, God's name is repeated as a soul arrives from the world of the unseen into the world of materialized form. Oh God, oh my God, ah. Initially, this may seem amusing, yet it is incontrovertible that these are universal clues to the process of manifestation. The energy released through the root or base chakra brings about procreation. And what has taken place here? A release of energy from the base chakra received by another base chakra and a soul connects to form from the unseen to the manifested, all accompanied by the sound of ah. Learning this technique of sound manifesting really involves nothing more than opening up the channel that exists between these two chakras in your body. Opening the third eye is an inner exercise of putting your attention at the third eye or mind chakra and projecting through it, feeling the joy that is associated with the sound ah. You experience it leaving the limits of your physical body, embracing that which you want to manifest and bringing it back to you. Implement this sound meditation in your morning practice. I have created a cassette tape and a compact disc called Meditations for Manifesting, which guides you through this morning meditation. In addition, that recording guides you through the second meditation, which takes place in the evening. However, here you put your attention on gratitude for all that has manifested into your life. This is also the subject matter of the ninth and final principle. Now we listen to the sound of that which is manifested. There's a second sound that reflects the vibrational frequency of manifestations in the physical plane. This sound is OM. If you reduce anything that you can observe on the physical plane to its ultimate sound vibration, you would hear the sound OM. This is the sound that women of ancient times meditated to while bringing their babies into the world. Whereas AH is the sound of creation, OM is the sound of that which is already created. Om expresses gratitude for all that has manifested. There's a basic relationship between our level of awareness and the vibrations of the universe. This is why I include the Om meditation in the manifestation process. Repeating the Om sound in the evening tunes you to a higher state of awareness and to gratitude for all that has manifested into your life. Repeating this sound as a mantra of gratitude is one of the most joyous feelings you will ever experience, causing you to be in harmony with your environment. Using the OM sound is a way of bonding to all that manifests for you, in whatever form it shows up. It creates a peaceful space and contributes to your identifying with the manifesting principle. These two sounds, AH and OM, used on a daily basis, form the basis for your becoming adept at connecting with what you desire and understanding totally the message of this tape, which is that you indeed manifest your own desires and destiny. Now let's take a look at the practice of meditating for manifesting. Manifesting and meditating cannot be separated. They are like the crest and the trough of the wave, separate and distinct from each other, but always together. You cannot become adept at manifesting the desires of your heart if you are unwilling to devote time to the practice of meditation. Meditation is simply the act of being quiet with yourself and shutting down the constant monologue that fills the inner space of your being. That inner noise is a shield preventing you from knowing the highest self. Engaging in sound meditation is a useful way of accomplishing inner silence and removing the influences of the constant chatter that is largely produced by the ego. The best times for meditating using this manifesting technique of repetitive sounds are at sunrise and sunset. 
If you are unaccustomed to arising at or before sunrise, make an effort to establish this discipline for a trial period of 90 days. What you want to do is establish yourself as a disciplined person. Early morning, particularly prior to sunrise, is the best time of day to awaken. The silence allows you to feel close to God. You can feel the energy of healing and solutions in the silence. Use specific acts of personal courage to awaken during these hours, knowing that the time will provide you with far more rest than the remaining hours of your scheduled sleep. When the sun first begins to show itself in the morning, its energy breaking out of the darkness is most intense. This is the ideal time to begin your manifesting meditation. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. And where there are tongues, they will be stilled. And where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Yes, and the greatest of these is love. I'm well aware of the improbability of living an unconditionally loving life in all of our moments. I imagine your ego is protesting that this idea is absurd because you are only human and humans have shortcomings. Nevertheless, I ask you to do this exercise for a few days or a week. You see, I know that it will become habitual when you feel the richness of your life with this new awareness. There's something that is called the process of detached observation. One of the great meditation exercises that I learned many years ago involves imagining lifting yourself out of your body and floating into space so far that you are actually observing the entire planet. If you do this, try to imagine what the Earth is like without you on it. It is a very difficult task for your ego to even contemplate the world without you on it. Next, begin to observe the planet without any judgment, refusing to label anything good or bad, right or wrong. Simply instruct yourself to notice, allow, and send unconditional love. The process of being a detached observer occurs in the silence of your contemplations or meditations. Begin by seeking out time to be quiet and enter this inner place of love. It is in that silence that you will come to truly know the divine energy of unconditional love. It's a difficult thing for our egos to contemplate this concept of oneness. Unconditional love and becoming a co-creator in your life is possible when you know that God is not separate from you. You and God are one and the same. In the New Testament, Jesus says to the multitudes, I have said, ye are gods. And later, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. What it means to be in a state of oneness is that you know the unconditional love that God has for all of creation is also the unconditional love that can be you if you make that choice. If you place restrictions on that love or withhold it dependent on your judgments and hatreds, then you make it a conditional love and remove yourself from the possibility of co-creating with God. We have unconditional freedom for our thoughts to be what they are. That is how you are loved. That is your gift from the Divine Creator, expressed through your individuality. Take that freedom away, and you are no longer a human being. You lose your humanity when you lose the unconditional love that allows you to think as you choose. Now suppose that you're able to function in the same unconditionally loving way, simply allowing without judging. You would be experiencing oneness. Your will and God's will would not be in conflict. Use this love for the purpose of creation. Every moment that you create by radiating unconditionally loving thoughts is a reflection of the same love that was responsible for your creation. This unconditional love is really a power. The ability to reach a higher state of being where there seems to be almost no delay between the creation of a thought form and having that thought form show up 
can be viewed in terms of unconditional love and an absence of making demands on or judging the world. This is a power that I know is possible for each of us when we begin to adopt the basic principles of spiritual manifestation. Most of us simply do not recognize how truly powerful we are by virtue of our own ability to create thoughts, and out of these thoughts attract to ourselves the abundance of the universe. When we think rationally about this power, we immediately think of the conflict between having a free will and having a destiny. This conflict often obviates the need within us to think and live in unconditionally loving ways. Let's take a quick look at this matter of destiny, which is in the title of this tape, and put it into a different context. Destiny is not preordained. Destiny is ordained totally by you. Every single moment of your now existence is the result of your previous thought. The idea that everything is already laid out for you in advance is a hallucination. You can and do manifest your own destiny. Your free will is your gift of unconditional love. You create the destiny with this free will, and when you venture off the path of unconditional love, you are simply living an illusion. The illusion is that the thoughts that you have of your separateness from God's will put you into an obsequious position, that God is something you must fight or fear. Obviously, if this were true, God could not at the same time be all loving. So what it means here is that you want to know the joy of unconditional love. The most important thing that you will gain from cultivating unconditional love will be freedom from hate and violence. When these thoughts are removed, you discover the presence of joy and peace. This is an automatic reaction to unconditional love because you are in harmony with the creative source. The ego identifies you primarily as a physical body, separate from God and in need of constant stroking to massage your self-importance. When you simply say this is an illusion and it doesn't really exist, those ideas are replaced with unconditional love and the joy you experience is really the denial of the false and an affirmation of the truth of your being. You are absolutely free when you are not consumed with your self-importance. You are free when you no longer need to be stroked, coddled and approved of by everyone you meet. There is a great sense of joy in feeling free. Think of times when you have felt the freest in your life, when the pressures to perform are off, when you are walking in nature, when you are in solitude and communing with God. Joy, freedom and unconditional love are inseparable. They flow from the experience of each other. To be joyful is to hold on to nothing and to have no restrictions. This is also the feeling of freedom and it is a result of embracing the unconditional love of the divine energy that is the center of your being. This is not to say that one ought not to enjoy a massage, a delicious meal, love making and all of the pleasures of the body, but it is the mind that is processing and allowing you to experience the pleasure. It is the mind that makes it real. Your purpose is to align your mind with the unconditional love that is the divine source of all material things, including your body. With that alignment comes joy and power. When one drop of water separates from the ocean, it becomes a speck that is essentially powerless and weak. But when it aligns with its source, the ocean itself, it is powerful beyond what is possible as an individual drop of ocean. And so it is with you. Unconditional love is really nothing more than the absence of fear. The ego is where fears originate, with constant messages that you are incomplete and need more, that you need to win to be better in comparison to others. A fourth attitude of self-acceptance says, I do not choose to accept guilt into my life. This mindset creates thoughts such as, I will not use up the precious currency of my life, my present moments, immobilized with guilt over what happened in the past. This statement requires you to know the difference between a. genuine regret and learning from the past and b. remaining in a state of reproach or guilt today. Learning from one's mistakes and taking corrective action are spiritually and psychologically sound practices. You did it, you didn't like the way you felt afterwards, so you decide not to repeat the behavior. That is not guilt. Guilt is when you continue to feel immobilized and depressed, those feelings keep you from living effectively in the present. When you are filled with guilt, your energy is awash with anguish and self-reproach. You are so down on yourself that you are feeling unworthy of receiving blessings from the universe or anyone in it. Persistent feelings of guilt will prevent you from manifesting anything worthwhile because you are attracting the very same things that you are putting out to the universe. For example, if you are chronically overweight or addicted, your internal sentence of guilt sounds something like this, I'm really going to love myself when I finally am at a normal weight or I will truly value myself as a worthwhile human being when I am finally over this addiction once and for all. 
these internal sentences need to be shifted to, I love myself while I am overweight. I am not this weight in the first place, and I refuse to think of myself in self-degrading terms regardless of the condition of my body. I am love, and I extend this love to all of me. This same kind of inner programming must take place for addictions or anything else that you feel guilty about. By removing the inclination to wallow in self-reproach, we remove the idea that by suffering in the present moment, we will redeem ourselves and can pay for our sins with guilt. Life doesn't work this way. The solution is in loving yourself and in trusting in God that your shortcomings are nothing more than lessons leading you to a new spiritual level. And finally, a fifth assessment of those who have self-acceptance. I understand the importance of having harmony between my thoughts, my feelings, and my behavior. To the extent that you remain incongruent in any of these three areas of thinking, feeling, or behaving, you will impede the process of heightened awareness and the ability to manifest your heart's desire. This is the last of the five points that contribute to your feelings of worthiness about receiving God's munificence into your life. It is also the most significant because it defines your level of integrity. To have thoughts about how you would like to conduct your life, to posit these thoughts as your essential way of being, and then to feel guilty, fearful, anxious, or anything else as a result of not living up to these inner positions, results in addictive, manipulative, and self-defeating behavior. To be congruent, you must be honest about your own thoughts. If you are honest with yourself, you will find that your emotional reactions will be consistent with your inner world. You will feel peaceful and content, and this will be apparent in your behavior. This is true for virtually everything about your life. Your thoughts about health, relationships, prosperity, God, work, recreation, whatever. If these thoughts are rooted in love and you honestly know that you are here to express love, kindness and forgiveness toward yourself, toward your work and co-workers, toward the money you receive, toward your spiritual beliefs, then you will be in harmony and you will welcome the blessings that result from your personal conduct in these matters. However. If you embrace these thoughts, yet fail to act on them in the daily working of your life, you will feel incongruent, and consequently, you will not feel that you are deserving of desires being fulfilled. Being eaten up inside, in your own private corner of awareness that is not available to anyone else other than God, you will behave in self-defeating ways that verify your lack of inner congruity. These five attitudes provide you with the tools for creating an inner atmosphere of worthiness. They all reflect an ability to live peacefully in the present moment and to discard many of the attitudes of your past that keep you in a constant state of feeling powerless and unworthy of being able to manifest more blessings and happiness into your life. And then it's necessary to begin to look at how you can unbond yourself from your past wounds. The inclination to bond to our wounds rather than move past them traps us in a constant state of feeling unworthy. A person who has experienced traumatic events in life such as incest or abuse or sexual molestation or the death of loved ones or traumatic illnesses or accidents or family disruptions or drug addictions can become bonded to them and replay them for attention or pity. Very often the tale of these woes is told with a sort of urgency for the listener to know how horrible the wounding was and still is. The ego uses this energy as a power play in individual and group situations to encourage discussion of one's struggle to survive the wounded. This can keep individuals from advancing spiritually and reinforce the image of themselves as unfortunate. The tendency to bond with the wounds of our lives reminds us of how unworthy we are of receiving anything that we really would like because we remain in a state of suffering. The more these painful stories are recalled and repeated, the more we are guaranteed of not attracting our desires. Notice your body when it is wounded. An open wound actually closes up quite quickly. Just imagine what it would be like if that wound remained open for a long time. It would become infected and ultimately would kill the entire organism. The closing up of a wound and allowing it to heal can work the same way in your inner world of thoughts. When you go backward and continuously relive your pain, including labeling yourself incest survivor, alcoholic, sexual abuse survivor, you do so because of your inner experiences of bitterness. This harvest of bitterness keeps you from feeling worthy. So don't lead with your injuries. Deal with them and ask family and friends to be compassionate while you are grieving or recuperating. Then ask them to kindly remind you when it has taken on the form of a predictable response. 
The way out of bonding to your wounds is through forgiveness. Forgiveness is the most powerful thing you can do for your physiology and your spirituality. Forgiveness means that you fill yourself with love and you radiate that love outward and refuse to hang on to the venom or hatred that was engendered by the behaviors that caused the wounds in the first place. Forgiveness is a spiritual act of love for yourself and it sends a message to everyone including yourself that you are an object of love and that is what you are going to impart. Feeling worthy is essential to being able to attract to yourself what you desire. It is simply a matter of common sense. If you don't feel that you deserve something, why would the divine energy that is in all things send it your way? Let's look at a plan for adopting and honoring your worthiness to receive and attract from the divine source. The word inspiration literally means to be infused with spirit. In spirit, if you will. Practice doing what you love and loving what you do each day. This puts you in spirit and literally provides you with the enthusiasm for being a worthy recipient of God's grace. The word enthusiasm comes from the Greek root entheos, to be filled with God. Then make every effort to remove internal habits of pessimism, negativity, judgment, complaints, gossip, cynicism, resentment, and fault-finding from your vocabulary and your inner dialogue. Replace them with optimism, love, acceptance, kindness, and peace as your way of processing your world and the people in it. Then give yourself quiet time each day to erase feelings of unworthiness. And also read spiritual literature and poetry and listen to soothing classical music whenever possible. I have found that simply reading the poetry of Walt Whitman or Rabindranath Tagore or Rumi puts everything into a more sacred perspective for me. This beautiful poem from Khalil Gibran's The Prophet is an example of such literature. Pay particular attention to the words your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and nights, and for the soul walks upon all paths. Close your eyes and allow yourself approximately 20 minutes for this morning practice. Take in a few long deep breaths and exhale, becoming aware of the pattern of your breathing and the feeling of filling your lungs. Then place your attention on the root or base chakra, the sex center, and move your attention up the passageway between your root chakra and your third eye chakra. Think of this as a channel that has been clogged, and think of the third eye space as an opening that has been sealed for a long time that you are going to open with your new inner etheric energy. Now take a deeper, longer breath of air, filling your lungs, and as you release the breath, say out loud the sound, ah, with as much emotion and volume as you can imagine. Ah. Place your attention on clearing the channel with the sound of ah. While you are doing the ah meditation, add to your mental picture what it is that you would like to be able to create or manifest without being at all attached to how it will surface in your life. Repeat the sound of ah as your mantra for the entire time. However, do it out loud and with emotion for only approximately the first one third of the time. Move your attention up and down the inner passageway between the root chakra and the third eye chakra. With the inner energy that you are feeling from the sound of creation resonating within you, open this third eye in your mental picture and propel the creative force through it into the world of form. Imagine its release from your inner being to a point at which it circles the world and surrounds the objects of your desire. Trust that this energy will connect with the universal energy that is the God force and will send the objects of your desire into your immediate world. This must be done in accordance with all nine of the principles of manifesting that are explained in this tape which means you have an absence of doubt, complete trust, unconditional love, and a knowing that this power of attraction is within you and in all things. Gradually you will begin to experience an overwhelming sense of bliss and peace. For the next approximately one-third of the morning meditation, say the ah sound softer and softer. Stay focused on the third eye, which is now open and sending out this creation energy and the feeling of your desire manifesting. For the final third of your morning meditation, repeat the sound of ah to yourself silently as a mantra and keep your attention on the third eye and the glorious feeling of gratitude that you are already experiencing for having this manifest into your life. When you have completed approximately 20 to 30 minutes of this manifesting meditation, your morning session will be complete. Some people have used this meditation to manifest peace for themselves or those they love, to center themselves on a healing or to bring a relationship into their life. Others have used it for such matters as selling a house, getting a promotion, overcoming an addiction, attracting money, or whatever. The possibilities are unlimited. What you are doing when you do this morning ah meditation 
is resonating with the words, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The act of manifesting is the beginning of something being created in your life. The evening meditation is best practiced at sunset if possible. Once again, as the sun sinks below the horizon, there is a corona-like expression of energy that is greatest just as the sun leaves the horizon and for a few moments immediately after. Now you practice the sound of Om, which is the meditation of gratitude. The practice is identical to the morning meditation with the exception that now you are not asking to manifest anything. Instead, at the end of your daylight or as you retire, you are simply saying thank you to the universal intelligence that we call God for all that has manifested in your life. Take in deep breaths just as you did in the morning. Clear the channel between your base chakra and your third eye chakra and mentally picture all that you have received and project that energy out forcefully through the opening of the third eye. You are expelling into the universe beyond your immediate body an energy of gratitude. The sound of Om is said aloud for the first third of your meditation, then gradually, more quietly, and ultimately silently, always focusing grateful attention on the third eye and feeling that energy going back to the universal source of energy that we call God. The final part of this meditation is the last sound you hear before you go to sleep each night. The very first sound you hear in the morning is generally one of ah. It is the sound that you make when you yawn or stretch. However, the final sound you hear within yourself before going to sleep can be a combination of these two sounds of ah and om. I defined enlightenment earlier as the ability to be immersed in and surrounded by peace. It is not an accident that the sounds ah and om, when combined, translate to the word that means peace or enlightenment. Shalom. Shalom. By saying these two sounds to yourself as you drift off to sleep, you are becoming at one with all that is peaceful and all that provides for us. It is also not an accident that the primary sound of spiritual joy is the sound of Ah in Alleluia. And it is also a sound in the last word of every prayer, Amen. Give this glorious, peaceful, enlightening manifestation meditation practice a three-month trial using each of the nine principles outlined in this book and see if you do not experience your heart's desire appearing. Alleluia. Shalom. The eighth principle for spiritual manifesting simply says, patiently detach from the outcome. In the seventh principle on the use of sound meditation, I emphasize the importance of placing your attention on your feelings as you picture your desire manifesting. This eighth principle of spiritual manifesting has at its heart the experience of that feeling. The manner of how and when it is desired shows up is something that you must not try to control. Manifesting is not about making demands of God in the universe. Manifesting is a cooperative venture in which your intention is aligned with divine intelligence. That intelligence is in all things and in you simultaneously. Demanding that God send your desire according to your timetable and design reinforces the incorrect idea of God as a separate energy. There's an important concept to try to grasp here. It's called intelligence apart from individuality. Most of us believe that the recognition of any other individual affirms a point at which our own individuality ceases and the other's begins. This belief is part of our conditioning and it imposes a great deal of limitation on us. If this pattern were ascribed to the universal mind, it would describe a God that at some point ceased and something else began. Here's Khalil Gibran on self-knowledge. And a man said, speak to us on self-knowledge. And he answered saying, your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and nights, but your ears thirst for the sound of your heart's knowledge. You would know in words that which you would have always known in thought. You would touch with your fingers the naked body of your dreams. And it is well you should. The hidden wellspring of your soul must needs rise and run murmuring to the sea. And the treasure of your infinite depths would be revealed to your eyes, but let there be no scales to weigh your unknown treasure. And seek not the depths of your knowledge with staff or sounding line, for self is a sea boundless and measureless. Say not, I have found the truth, but rather, I have found a truth. Say not, I have found the path of the soul. Say rather, I have met the soul walking upon my path. For the soul walks upon all paths. The 
soul walks not upon a line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like a lotus of countless petals. Allow yourself to be surrounded by things of beauty as much as possible. Each evening I leave my typewriter and I go out to the beach and I experience the magnificence of the sun setting over the Gulf of Mexico. To be a part of this sunset fills me with a sense of home beyond this planet and opens me up to the deeper nature within myself. I could never feel unworthy of the grace and munificence of the universe when I'm immersed in such beauty. Virtually any experience of beauty has a tendency to remove doubt about your own divinity and connection to the ultimate truth that is in everything and everyone. And then practice kindness toward yourself and others as frequently as possible. Give up your need to be right and to win in favor of being kind, and you will soon know the bliss of inner peace. Remember, your highest self only wants peace. When you are practicing kindness, peace shows up right on schedule. When you are at peace with yourself and your world, you know that you are a worthy recipient of all that comes your way. Make it your own special mission to be kind to others each day at least once, and to extend the same privilege to yourself as much as possible. Also, begin to process the universe as a friendly rather than an unfriendly place. Place all of your wounds from the earlier stages of your life into the category Lessons for Life. Remember, for every act of evil, there are a million acts of kindness. This universe runs on the energy of harmony and balance. Breathe in that energy and breathe out the ideas of your being life's victim. And finally, say it over and over until it registers. I am what I am and I am worthy of the abundance that is the universe and all that is in it, including me. You are now on a path of knowing you are worthy of attracting and manifesting in your world. You are aware of your highest self. You trust in yourself and the divine wisdom that created you. You know that you are not separate from your environment and that the power to attract is within you. The next principle involves the energy of love and how important it is to know and experience it in all of your being before you begin applying the last three principles of manifestation. Our sixth principle for spiritual manifestation is called connecting to the divine source with unconditional love. There's a wonderful quote from Mirabai. It says this as she talks about herself. Mirabai knows that to find the divine one, the only indispensable, is love. There is no greater power in heaven or on earth than pure unconditional love. This is the heart of the sixth principle of manifestation. The nature of the God force, that unseen intelligence in all things, which causes the material world and is the center of both the spiritual and physical plane, is best described as pure unconditional love. It is the glue that holds all things material in place and keeps them from collapsing into uncountable particles. This God force is the oversoul to which we are always connected because we are localized extensions of that force. You may feel infinitely worthy of attracting to yourself material and spiritual prosperity, but if you are not living the way of unconditional love, you are interfering with your ability to manifest in your life. In order to be divinely aligned with the universal infinite energy, you must become unconditional love. This energy of love really dissolves all limitations. When I speak of love emanating from your soul and from the divine consciousness of God, I speak of something that the lower self or the ego cannot grasp. I am not speaking about feeling good toward others, romantic love, showering everyone with affection, or touchy-feely behavior here. This unconditional love is an experience of the harmony of life. It is simply too deep and too profound for our ordinary selves to activate. The energy of unconditional love is the power behind creation. It guides all of our natural laws. This love can be imagined as a vibration that carries thought forms from one's mind into material expression. In its highest nature, love is the force that we recognize as the will of God. It is the alchemy that we embrace to make sense of how things are materialized from the world of spirit. I suggest you embark on an experiment in which you practice unconditional love for several days, perhaps even a week. Make this a private activity. Bow to yourself that you will allow only unconditional loving thoughts to emanate from your consciousness. Refuse to have judgmental or critical thoughts. In your quiet time, think only peace and love. In all of your relationships, think and act in only loving ways. Extend loving thoughts and energy wherever and whenever you encounter anyone or anything. Become unconditional love for this period of time. 
This practice of becoming unconditional love is a prerequisite to the manifesting process. By pouring love into your immediate environment and practicing gentleness in all of your thoughts, words and actions, your immediate circle of friends will begin responding in a whole new way. Furthermore, this act becomes expansive very quickly and you can radiate this love to your community and to people you read about in newspapers, including those who are labeled terrorists, murderers, scam artists and the like. You emphasize the UN in unconditional love. You become detached and loving toward all. You are not loving the hostile act, but you are loving the spirit that is blocked in those who are harmful and unloving. When you can live this way and reject all thoughts and actions that are not of an unconditionally loving nature, you will experience the alchemy of your spirit and know how to overcome limitations in your life. This is a task that your conditioning will not easily encourage. But for a few days you can persevere just so you know what the divine universal spirit is like. It judges no one and nothing. It does not moralize. It does not show favoritism. It merely exists as an unconditional love, radiating harmony and allowing everything and everyone to unfold. What can you expect as you practice a few days of being total unconditional love? You will feel yourself becoming a different person. You will feel at peace virtually all of the time. Your relationships will be more deeply spiritual. Most significantly, you will begin recognizing the coincidences of your life with greater regularity. Your thought forms of unconditional love will begin to produce what you desire without your even being aware of how it is happening. There's an off-quoted passage in the New Testament that seems appropriate here. It's Corinthians 13 on love. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. With its unceasing pressure, the ego keeps you in a constant state of turmoil and anxiety. Here is where all fears are birthed and nurtured within you. To accept unconditional love as your premise for living, you will have to tell the ego that there is no need to prove anything and that all you want or hope for is already here. With this kind of declaration, fear is removed from your life and is replaced with love. Remember the biblical quote, Perfect love casteth out all fear. This principle of unconditional love as a prerequisite to manifesting your own destiny is a tough one to put into practice full time. Yet you could begin this process by working on it one step at a time, beginning right now. Here are a few of the ways of putting unconditional love into practice in your life. Remember to keep uppermost in mind that love transforms. Unconditional love heals the body and the mind. And then also remember that the polarity of love is fear. Fear is a current of energy that literally runs through your body and is produced when you feel cut off from the source of unconditional love. Every time you experience fear, ask yourself, what's going on that I have substituted fear for love in this moment? Also, begin to acquire a private, non-publicized and regular habit of meditating. With every breath you take, feel yourself taking in unconditional love. With every exhalation, expel thoughts of fear. Then pick one day to practice this exercise with a partner of your choice. Make a decision to think, act, and radiate nothing but unconditional love for the entire 24-hour period, including your dreams. If this works for you for one day, see if you can extend it for another day or two. Also, try making a decision to turn over your most difficult challenges in the area of unconditional love to God. Simply turn them over with a request such as, I have been unable to bring love into my life in these areas and I am asking for your divine guidance in accomplishing this. Also in your silent moments of prayer, do not be afraid to ask for help. And then know the connection between manifesting your heart's desire and unconditional love. Without your connection to this love, you lose your connection to the creative process. Unconditional love is in all things you wish to attract as well as in you. Keep it honestly, and you keep your ability to know that you are a God. Lose it, and you lose your godliness. It is that simple. And finally, make your word law. If you say it, live up to it lovingly. This gives you a sense of inner balance. The universe runs on balance, and the energy that keeps it in balance is love. By declaring yourself a person who keeps his word, you align yourself with the loving essence of the world. 
This concludes the sixth principle for manifesting. Unconditional love is the cornerstone of your mental picture. You refuse to allow any contrary ego-driven thought to enter the inner kingdom of love. If you activate this principle, you will have revealed the truth that eludes most people. It is with unconditional love that you find your true connection to the divine energy that is in all things. Our seventh principle of spiritual manifestation is simply meditating to the sound of creation. This seventh principle of manifesting will challenge your conditioning probably more than any of the other eight principles. However, while it contradicts your beliefs about how you fit into the universe, it also expands your ability to create and attract the objects of your heart's desire. Others who have done this meditation on a regular basis have experienced dramatic shifts in their lives and have been able to manifest what they previously believed to be impossible. As you begin opening yourself to this soul-nourishing practice of chanting to the sounds of creation, spend some time carefully studying the other eight principles. When you begin to practice the two daily manifesting meditations, you need to trust in your highest self and meditate with unconditional love. Reviewing the other eight principles will help to make trust and love available. Meditating with sound can work dramatically in your personal life and can also facilitate a new awareness of our collective abilities to manifest a world free of the demands and petty issues of the ego. I feel blessed to have a spiritual teacher, Sri Guruji, make these meditations available to me to teach to others. Sounds have the power to generate your ability to attract to yourself that which you desire. Three key words describing the principle are the title of the following section. Listen carefully to these three words. Sounds have power. Sounds are a powerful energy. Every sound is a vibration made of waves oscillating at a particular frequency. The frequency range of the human ear is approximately 16 to roughly 40,000 vibrations per second. Sound is the intermediary between abstract ideas and concrete form in the material world. Sound literally mold the abstract world of thought and spirit into shapes. In ancient ceremonial rites, words, sounds, and shapes combine to achieve certain ends. Each letter in a word signifies a sound and records the expression of a particular sound. Differing sounds were recorded for their own purposes. Sounds have an impact on us in a myriad of ways. The discordant and harassing sounds of machines, thudding, screaming, grating noises, bombard our consciousness and make it difficult to be serene and peaceful. Discordant sounds can cause internal illness or disease. The sound also has healing properties when it is harmonious and soothing. Healing takes place to the accompaniment of soothing harmonies and nature's music interspersed with spiritually nourishing silence. In addition to healing, sound is used in the creation process which is the central concern of this seventh principle of spiritual manifestation. When we use the sounds of nature that are most consistent with the act of creation, we begin to attract the material form that we desire. Learning how to use sound is a way of harnessing its power for manifesting thought into the world of form. Manifesting is knowing how to make contact with that spiritual vibrational frequency while we are living inside a body in a materialized world. Pay attention to words and sounds because they can attract positive or negative influences into your life. Harmonious sounds are the ones that most contribute to a balanced and creative life. But before going into the actual use of meditation sounds, it is necessary to learn how to prepare yourself to use sounds in your daily meditation. You need to gain access to a method that will take you beyond the mind to a state of consciousness that transcends your thoughts. This higher state of consciousness beyond the mind is called Siddhi Awareness, S-I-D-D-H-I, Siddhi Awareness. Siddhi Awareness or Siddhi Consciousness is a perfect state of awareness in which there is a complete absence of doubt and no delay between the origination of a thought and its materialization into the world of form. It is an unlimited state of being in which creation occurs instantly without any time lag from thought to form. When we contemplate this state of grace, our minds challenge the idea and provide us with many reasons as to why it is impossible. Siddhi consciousness, however, has absolutely nothing to do with the mind. Let that sink in. Siddhi consciousness is beyond the mind. This state of graceful being has nothing to do with the mind, whose nature is a constant inner monologue. The mind frets continually about an unlimited number of desires that can never be adequately fulfilled. 
You can give your body great pleasures with booze and sex. Give it fancy automobiles and delectable gourmet meals, body massages, and every other imaginable delight. The next morning, when it recovers, your mind has a new list of demands taped to your forehead, asking for more and more of what it can never get enough of. This is the nature of the mind, which is ruled by the ego. Your mind, then, is only a barrier to experiencing city consciousness, wherein you are in a state of bliss and complete acceptance, and your desires are the same as your experience of life. Your mind blocks the vision of your highest awareness. Your highest self has its own language. When your body is stilled and totally in the present, thoughts disappear. Then you can start the exquisite process of meditating with sound. It is the magic of this sound meditation that I am going to explain in the seventh principle. This is a siddha technique to take you beyond the constraints of the ego and the mind to a place within yourself where you can change your vibrational frequency through the use of sounds of creation. There's a magic to the sound of creation. As you begin to incorporate these ideas of the power of sound into your consciousness, going beyond the darkness of your mind to the light of your highest self, think about these words that open the book of John in the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. To be universal and to recognize anything as being outside itself would be to deny its very being. So the nature of universal intelligence is an absence of individual personality. You are in an impersonal and intensely intelligent ocean of life that is all around, under and in everything, including you. Though you have been conditioned to believe that you are an individual, you are actually a part of the grand universal nature that is infinite in its possibilities. This undifferentiated intelligence responds to you when you recognize it. Ask yourself what the relationship of this universal mind is to you. It cannot have favorites if it is the root and support for everything and everyone. Lacking individuality, it cannot be in conflict with your desires. Being universal, it cannot be simply shut off from you. All these statements characterize this all-producing mind as responsive to you when you understand your relationship to it. Your task is to bring the universal energy within your grasp by raising yourself to the level of that which is universal, rather than bring the universal down to a level of misperceived individuality that is separate from the universal. You need only to recognize it to attract it to yourself, rather than ask it to recognize you and bring you to it. Having learned a different set of principles, all of this may sound a bit confusing, yet it is crucially important for you to know this before moving along on the path of manifesting. There's a power of infinite patience. This provocative line is from A Course in Miracles. Those who are certain of the outcome can afford to wait and without anxiety. The notions of certainty and patience go together. When you trust and know that you are connected to that universal all-providing intelligence, then you simply place no time constraints on your manifestation. Your knowing and your infinite patience put you at ease. Your inner sense is that what you want to manifest is already here and your inner attention is on the feeling of well-being that you are already blessed with what you seek. The inner bliss is a function of the power of your infinite patience. When you are certain about the outcome and unconcerned with the how and when, you have cultivated the power of infinite patience and simultaneously you have detached yourself from the outcome. When this detachment takes place, you are able to go about your daily business of raising your children, doing your work or training, meditating and communing with God, and just patiently observing. Infinite patience is a sign of trust, and it calls upon infinite love to produce results in your life. When you let go of impatience, you are aligned with the God force, and the anxiety that tells you what is lacking and missing in your life is gone. You will know that God has been patient with you no matter how long it took you to come around, regardless of how far you may have wandered and no matter how much you may have refused to listen. Infinite patience produces almost immediate results in your life. You become free when you relax your insistence to have it now. As an infinitely patient person, you know that you are already where you want to be and there are no accidents and that all that appears to be missing is nothing more than an illusion perpetrated by your ego. With this awareness, impatience leaves, and you stop looking for results of your manifesting meditation. Your patience allows you to remain in silent appreciation of all that is manifested in your life. This practice of patient detachment from outcome is a foreign concept to us. 
We have been taught that goals, success symbols, and the accumulation of merit badges are the ways to feel important. What follows is a guide for living with the seeming paradox of attempting to manifest something into your life and at the same time not being attached to when and how it shows up. So here's a step-by-step -step plan for putting patient detachment into your manifesting practice. First, understand the essence of what you desire. What you desire is not necessarily in the realm of things. If you want to manifest money, for example, notice if your attention is centered on the dollars or on the experience and feeling of financial security. The experience is the essence of your desire. By putting your attention on inner feelings, you shift from being gratified by externals. The essence of your desire is a feeling of well-being and joy and an alignment with the universal spirit. You may feel that you truly want to manifest more income and a promotion. Detach yourself from the in-the-world promotion and increase in pay. Put your manifesting energy on the essence. You are wanting to feel more secure and less stress. You will probably begin to see things arriving in your life that reduce your anxiety. They may seem to have very little to do with what you originally thought you wanted. And then secondly, banish doubt and enter into the realm of certainty. When you've removed doubt about your ability to manifest, it will be easy to detach yourself from the outcomes and all of the details. Your trust in yourself and in the divine energy of the universe is all you will need. Then third, leave your expectations and go about your business. Maintain your work and play regime with a new sense of peace originating in your inner knowing about what is manifesting for you. Remain completely detached from the inclination to measure and calculate what is and is not showing up for you. And then fourth in this step-by-step -step plan, maintain privacy about your desires. Sharing your manifestation efforts decreases the energy and deflects the energy into the ego's need to gain approval. Then fifth, be aware of the cues that your desires are manifesting. Keep in mind that the way things will show up in your life is not necessarily related to what your rational brain expects. Things may begin popping up into your life that were never there before and which may surprise you as you notice them more and more frequently. These synchronistic events and happenings are the result of beginning to live in a heightened state of awareness. Pay close attention to the cues as they serve us and gently tell yourself, it's working, I can see the results. And then sixth, act immediately on the cues that arrive by acknowledging them. When you acknowledge the early signs of arrival of what you wish to manifest, you are giving your inner energy a positive charge and recognizing the divine universal intelligence. This recognition is essential to the continuation of this manifesting process. And seventh, don't think of your manifestation as a special favor. To see manifestation as a favor is to begin the process of bargaining with God and believing in your separateness from all other living things. Your desires manifest because you are in perfect alignment with your source of creation and because you are not placing any limitations on what can come into your life. And then eighth, view any and all obstacles as lessons, not indications of failure. Keep in mind that you are practicing patience and detachment from outcome. Everything that shows up in your life is supposed to. This includes the falls in your life. They provide you with the energy to propel yourself to a higher state of awareness. And then ninth, release all judgment from your manifesting practice. This requires you to be willing to suspend your inclination to judge that which shows up in your life as right or wrong, good or bad, attractive or unattractive. Your judgments halt the flow of universal energy into your life and put you at odds with that divine power. Your ability to manifest depends in large part on your willingness to leave behind the collective judgments that make up the totality of human beliefs. Detaching from these beliefs is one of the greatest challenges of your life. You will probably experience a sense of loss and perhaps a feeling of loneliness as you make this step out of judgment. The reward is that you will begin to expand your own perceptions and accept what others believe are their perceptions. A business card you might find walking on the beach, a book or a tape recording, a message intended for another but is in your mailbox, all these can be cues. Send away all judgments about how anything arrives in your life and refuse to assume the collective judgments that permeate the beliefs of most of the people you encounter. As you notice what arrives and disappears, try to do it with a feeling of total acceptance. In your inner world now, anything you can imagine is actually a part of you. Your proclamation of being wealthy and happy, if taken to that inner non-judgmental world, will lead you to feel wealthy and happy. This in turn will lead you to begin acting in new ways. You will begin to create a new concrete reality of wealth and happiness within yourself as you generate a positive attitude toward all you encounter.
no judgments, simply maintaining an inner feeling of having already manifested whatever it is you desire. Your mind will attempt to use logic, but manifestation is not logical. Your mind will try to employ negativity, insisting that you are too old, too stupid, or too undeserving, that you never win anything, that you've wished for things in the past and been disappointed and there's no reason to expect things to change now. This is the attachment of the mind and the ego to results in past history. Meditation and intuitive feelings are two ways to supersede the mind. The emphasis is on detaching from the collective unconscious beliefs, refusing to judge, and patiently allowing the universal source to deliver what you are now totally aligned with in your inner world.